الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى أصحابه الغر الميمين وعن التابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعنا معهم بعفوك وكرمك يا أكرم الأكرمين اللهم بك أمسينا وبك أصبحنا وبك نحيا وبك نموت وإليك المصير اللهم ما أمسى بنا من نعمة أو بأحد من خلقك فمنك وحدك لا شريك لك فلك الحمد ولك الشكر يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك وبعد uh, Tonight إن شاء الله we're going to be spending about what 45 minutes an hour with a great personality uh, in our history uh, but before I, I speak about, about him, may Allah be pleased with him and the rest of the companions of our Honorable Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I must say that, subhanAllah, uh, it was very interesting just preparing for this, uh, for this uh, program. And you go over some information that you haven't touched for a long time. And subhanAllah, you realize... Um, you know, how, how relevant still these events and these personalities and individuals are until this day. And, uh, and the other also point that I wanted to make uh, before we begin is, uh, uh, you know, as we go over who Khalid bin Walid was and um, talk about his, for instance, lineage, uh, I'm not sure if you're going to, like, if everyone is going to pick on the fact that that he is related to the Prophet sallallahu in multiple ways. But this is not unique to Khalid. This is this is the case with most of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu who came from from Mecca. Not every single one of them, but the vast majority of them, those who are from Quraysh are all ultimately related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whether we realize this or not. And some of them are very close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they're close to one another. And they're even close to those with whom they had serious conflicts. Right? I just want us to remember this, that at the end of the day these are from the tribe of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that they were um, they were connected to one another. Um, so the companion we're discussing today, we, we know him as Khalid ibn Walid, right? But he is Khalid ibn Walid, and this Al Walid that he's the son of is none other than Al Walid ibn Mughira, who uh, did not accept Islam. He was very mesmerized and uh, stimulated by the message of the Qur'an and by the power of the Qur'an. And he was a, a noble man. That he was from a very noble clan. I mean, the tribe is Quraysh. The clan is Bani Makhzum. They were one of the most prominent clans um, of Quraysh. And furthermore, Al-Walid was from the most prominent family of Bani Makhzum. And he himself was the most prominent figure in his family. Right? Uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have hoped to win him over. And when he, when he told Quraysh to calm down and he went and approached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was speaking to the Prophet like his own nephew because he was referring to him as, O oh, son of my brother, you know, O oh, my nephew. You know, what is this matter that you're bringing forth that, that, that has shaken the foundation of, of our society. Um, so when the Prophet ﷺ heard what he had to say and then he said to him, 
Now are you ready to hear what I have to say in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shared with him his message and what the Quran what Allah revealed to him. Um, Al Walid was 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 blown away, literally. And he went back to Quraysh and he said, you know, listen, this is unlike anything. I have I have examined I know you know that I know poetry, you know that I know you know, this is nothing that that we are accusing him of of indulging in. So so Abu Jahl who was, by the way, Abu Jahl, we all know Abu Jahl, right? Abu Jahl's name is what? Anyone knows what Abu Jahl's name is? Amr ibn Hisham. Hisham ibn what? Amr ibn Hisham ibn al-Mughira. So he was his own nephew. Hisham ibn al-Mughira, the father of Abu Jahl, is the brother of al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Right? So Abu Jahl was the cousin of Khalid ibn walid and by the way, he was the uncle of who? Their sister is who? Their sister was none other than the mother of Umar ibn Khattab. So Umar ibn Khattab is Adawi from the clan of... Uh, but he is, from his mother's side, he's from Bani Makhzum. See how like intertwined they are, right? It's just amazing, subhanAllah. It's facet the dynamics are very fascinating. because This is key to understand... Because you know, there are some major events that took place. So Al-Walid ibn Mughira goes back and he says, okay, let me think about it. Oh, they said to him, Saharaka Muhammad. Oh, Muhammad uh, you know, got to you with his magic. His spells you know, got you. We thought you were solid. We, th we thought you were. You know. So he said, okay, okay, let me think about it. وَأَخَذَتُهُ الْعِزَّةُ بِالْإِثْمِ you know, His ego got to him. You know, you're going to follow Muhammad. He's one of your, you know, you know he's the, the, the age of some of your children. He's from Bani Hashim. I mean, all of these things must have gotten to him. So he said, let me think about this overnight. So he goes and then he comes the next day and he's like, okay, أَقْرَبُ الْأَقْوَالِ النَّقُولِ Let's just say, إِنَّهُ سَاحِرْ He is a sahir. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to him in the Quran. And he was condemned. And anyone, by the way, in, the, in, in these early days, anyone who was condemned didn't make it. There is no one that the Quran condemned. Right? And was able to come out of kufr. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran condemned him, right? In more than one place. One of them was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about, إِنَّهُ فَكَّرَ وَقَدَّرْ فَقُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرْ ثُمَّ قُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرْ ثُمَّ نَظَرْ ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَسَرْ ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ وَاسْتَكْبَرْ فَقَالَ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ يُؤْثَرْ Allah exposed what he said when he said this is magic. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, سَأُصْلِيهِ سَقَرْ I will burn him in a blazing fire. This is Al-Walid ibn Mughira. In another surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned him. And Allah azza wa jal in that surah exposed something that nobody knew about his, the legitimacy of his, uh, of his claims. To, uh, and in that surah, Allah also mentioned something that was very interesting, and that's why I'm bringing it up. Allah azza wa jal said about him, أَنْ كَانَ ذَا مَالٍ وَبَنِينَ ذَرْنِي وَمَنْ خَلَقْتُ وَحِيدًا Sorry, that is in Surah, uh, in surah Al-Muddathir. In another surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, عُتُلِّمْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ زَنِيمْ أَنْ كَانَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the same surah in which Allah said, he will, he will be burn, he, Allah will burn him in a hellfire, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, سَأُرْهِقُهُ صَعُودًا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he will be exhausted in hellfire, climbing a mountain of of, uh, of fire. Wal'ayadhu billah. In the same surah, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, ذرني ومن خلقته وحيدا وجعلت له مالا ممدودا وبنين شهودا. I have given him a lot of wealth and power. And I have given him children who will be, who will testify or who will be witnesses. At the time, nobody really understood what children who will testify means. But subhanAllah, Two of his children, actually more than two, uh, his children accepted Islam eventually. The first one to accept Islam was the eldest, right? Who, whom he named after himself. He was, his name was what? Al-Walid ibn Mughira. He named his child, the eldest child, Al-Walid. So he was Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid. Al-Walid, the son of, like Al-Walid Jr. Right? He accepted Islam first. And later... He accepts, uh, you know, his other son, who was the most famous, 
right, of his sons and, and children, Khalid ibn Walid accepted Islam. Right? So, so this is their father, and I wanted to just mention this. So he is Khalid ibn Walid ibn Mughira, ibn Abdullah ibn Amr, ibn Makhzum. This is Makhzum, the, the one to whom the, the clan of Bani Makhzum. And, and Bani Makhzum were a very prominent clan in Quraysh. Like, well, I'm talking about heavyweight, right? They, they were known for their beauty, for their wealth, for their power. Um, Ibn Yaqaba, Ibn Murra, Ibn Ka'b, Ibn Lu'ay. So he, he uh, his lineage and the Prophet Sallallahu lineage intersect where? Murra, Ibn Ka'b. So his great, 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 great grandfather is the great grandfather of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His most famous uh, kunia was Abu Sulaiman. Waqila Abu Walid. Um, so the sixth grandfather of his was, was the Prophet Sallallahu grandfather. Um, and I'm not going to... Well, so another fact that is very interesting about him, his grandmother, his maternal grandmother, the mother of his mother, right? Her name is Hind bint Awf. And what, what is very interesting about her is that they, she, they used to call her Akramu Ajuzin fil Ardi Ashara, her in-laws. Because her daughters, her daughters, she had many daughters, married, you know, the most prominent, the most important one of her daughters, because she, she married multiple times. She married more than once. So the most interesting uh, or the most uh, important daughter of hers was none other than Maymuna bint al-Harith. Okay? Who's Maymuna bint al-Harith? Umul Mu'mini, one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the mother of the believers. Uh, and on top of that, Zainab bint Khuzayma. These were two daughters from two different husbands. And who's Zainab bint Khuzayma? Who's Zainab bint Khuzayma? Umul Masakin, the wife of the Prophet, another wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So two of her daughters were married. She had these two daughters from two different men. Right? Were... Uh, and her other daughter is Lubab al-Kubra, Umm al-Fadl. And who's Umm al-Fadl? The wife of Abu al-Fadl. Who's Abu al-Fadl? Al-Abbas, radiallahu anhu. The uncle of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa Al-Abbas was married to another one of her daughters. Um, also, um, uh, um, Arwa bint Umais. The wife of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, her daughter from another husband. She, she, I told you she got married multiple times. So, so she had, she, she was married to Umais, the father of Arwa, the wife of Hamza. And also the father of Asma bint Umais, the very famous, who was married to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And then he was killed. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu married her. And then she was, uh, he, was, he died, radiallahu anhu. And then her last husband was Ali ibn Abi Talib. So, so it can't get, you know, the, these are her son-in-laws. Subhanallah. So she was his, uh, his grandmother. And he had uh, six, uh, they say he had six or nine um, siblings. Uh, of them are two companions. Um, and uh, these two companions were Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira and Hisham ibn Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira radiyallahu anhum they both were, were killed as martyrs um, and so Khalid ibn Walid grew up he was, uh, he was born in the year 509, uh, 592 right? he died at the age of 50 radiyallahu anhu ardah um, so he was much younger than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he grew up in a, in, a, in a very prominent household, ri very rich family. He was very, very tall, uh, strong, well-built, uh, you, know, uh, you know, thick beard, nice features, uh, very uh, athletic, uh, muscular. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a great warrior. Um, and he mastered, he was one of the few people who were known to be able to uh, 
uh, fight and swing swords with two hands while riding a, a, a horse. So he was able to stabilize himself on top of, on the back of a horse and, and, and do all kinds of maneuvers while fighting with two swords. You know. Uh, another person who was known for that was who? Cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm not sure if Ali used to fight with two. But everybody you see had their own unique style. <coughs> right? Uh, Ali radiallahu anhu had, had strength and you know, had very powerful blows. Right? Nothing could like, get in the way, stop, stop him. And he, had, uh, he was very, very strong. But he, wasn't, he didn't have like, height advantage. So everybody had their own style. Uh, but from what I remember, I don't remember that Ali used to fight with two swords. There's another cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu that used to t fight with two swords. Him and his son were both known for the same style. Zubair. Zubair bin Awam. Right? Was, was someone that used to be able to... Uh, this is other than some other um, warriors and knights in the, in the Arabian Peninsula that were known for that, like uh, Talha, Tulayha al-Asadi and, and these people. So... Um, so Quraysh put him in charge of their knights, of their cavalry, right? Um, and, and he was, um, anyways, there are a lot of myths about him as well, so I don't want to get into that because, you know. So he was very, very tall. He was, he was, um, he was strong. Uh, he was uh, of a light skin, uh, thick beard. Many people said that he resembled... Umar bin Khattab. And now, remember, what is his relationship to Umar? They said he looked like Umar so much so that people sometimes will confuse the two from distance. Right? What was Umar's relationship to Khalid? Umar's mother was Khalid bin Walid's first cousin. So he was like his uncle. Yeah. Abu Jahl Amr bin Hisham was Umar's Uncle, maternal uncle, Khaluhu. Yeah, right? So, uh, and, and, uh, so, so they were related. Not only were they related, they said they used to, because Umar was ben, from Banu Adi, but they lived in the, uh, you know, every clan had their own section in Mecca, their own area or their, their own neighborhood. So Umar was from Banu Adi, but they were the neighbors or he lived in the middle of the, uh, the, the quarter or the district or the, the neighborhood, whatever you want to call it, of Bani Makhzum, right? So he grew up, they grew up together. And they were rivals because they were the same build and stuff like that. They used to, you know. There are some stories that I don't know how, how true they are. I couldn't verify it, to be honest with you, because again, there is a lot of myth, a lot of fabricate, you know, fabrications that we have to be very careful of when we examine this, this, this part of our history. And Umar radiallahu anhu, they say that they, they used to fight, like when they were young, when they were teenagers, and that he, uh, he was able to beat Umar radiallahu anhu and break his leg, right? And Umar used to limp. I don't remember ever reading in the authentic sources that Umar had a limp. That was, right. right. Uh, were they rivals? Yes. But were they enemies? No, they were not enemies. So they said that Omar never forgot that, and that's why later on Omar tried to get back at him, which is like a completely a silly, um, silly uh, way of analyzing what happened later on. So were they relatives? Yes, they were relatives. Were they both on the same, on, on the same belief? Yes, for, for the longest time, until Omar accepted Islam, Khalid and Omar were, were, were buddies. And then there came the day Omar radiallahu anhu accepted Islam, and unlike anyone else, Omar didn't make it, uh, it wasn't a secret, right? He didn't hide that, that he converted to Islam. He actually went and he let his family know. And, uh, and they, uh, you know, he, and he let Quraysh know Omar was beaten. Uh, and I don't want to go to be, you know, to, but they left him alone because they knew that Bani Adi are not going to, if anything happens to Umar, they're going to come after them. So they left him alone, and Umar was very confrontational, radiallahu anhu arda. So Khalid and Umar, from then, they, 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 you can say, they parted ways from that, from that point and on. Later on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring their hearts together. Khalid ibn Walid, radiallahu anhu arda, uh, wasn't a Muslim at, the, at, this, at this point. He did not 
participate in the Battle of Badr. The Prophet and his companions went to Medina, they settled there, the Meccans. Khalid didn't, didn't engage in any, you know, he wasn't part of any other, you know, confrontations with them until the Battle of Badr, which he missed, luckily. Right? For him, yeah. Fortunately, he missed it. And when, and he was in Sham, he was in the Sham region, Viz, you know, doing some business during that time. So he missed it. So when he came back to Mecca, Mecca was mourning not only the dead of just you know few hundreds of uh, you know uh, uh, few dozens of people, but mourning the death and the 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 loss of their top, right? The you know cream of the crop, as they say, the top members of their clans. Of them was right. The most prominent figure that, that they lost in that battle was who? Yeah. Abu Jahl ibn Hisham. Amr ibn Hisham. His own uncle. And others. Right? So, of course, Khalid was part of the... You know, there was a lot of anger the following year. Abu Sufyan ibn Umayyah uh, from, from, uh, you know, from Bani Abd Shams leads the, the, an army of 3,000 people. On the cavalry was who leading leading the cavalry? Khajim Wali. They came back for full of anger and vengeance. And of course, they, they engaged in the in the you know next to the Mount of Uhud. During that battle, Khajim Wali did not charge, did not did not attack. He was waiting. Perhaps maybe you know he couldn't say anything. He may not have liked the the way the battle was going. But he was waiting for the moment where, where he, he was on one side, on the other side was Ikrimah. Ikrimah was his cousin, the son of Abu Jahl, right? So, so to, to the, the flanks, right? Um, Ikrimah got involved, because Ikrimah was looking for vengeance as well. He was immediately affected by this. Khalid Mawali didn't charge, waited, 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 and then when the Muslims pretty much were about to finish, finish off, the, the battle and they were winning the battle and the, 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 the individuals or the, the, um, the archers that the Prophet Sallallahu has stationed on the small mount next to Uhud known as Ar-Rumah left their position Khalid Walid found the opening that he was looking for so he went around went on top of the mountain finished the, the about the 10 or 12 companions who were there including uh, you know Abdullah ibn Jubair and, and the rest of them um, and then he came descending and attacked the Muslims, the ranks, from behind. And of course, that, that, that disrupted the, the way the battle was going. So many people, many historians say that Muslims did not lose that, but, well, Muslims neither won or lost that battle, and the person who disrupted that, who played a major role, was Khalid bin Walid in that battle. And then when, when they went... Uh, when they, when after the end, when the battle ended, well, before the battle ended, Khalid bin Walid was of the opinion of going and finishing them, off, like finishing the job, right? Because now the Sahaba disperse in every direction. Now, when the army disperses, there is not much you can do. You yourself, you will have to follow different people, so you're going to lose your formation, and you're going to lose. So it's going to be very chaotic, and you don't know. You may end up like hitting someone because back then they didn't have uniforms. And they didn't have certain markings that you can tell who's, who's who. They used to, they used to uh, have like, keeping your formation and staying with your, with your um, you know, division it was very important to know who's who. So now it, it, it became very chaotic. Unless you really identify the person and you can tell who it is, you may end up you know, uh, striking someone or shooting someone who's from your side. So Khalid was of the opinion of just following them in every direction. Abu Sufyan said, listen, khalas. We can claim this as a, as a victory. Because remember, also the Meccans had, had also ran in every direction. So many of them ran away. And many of them saw, thought that they lost the battle. So they ran away. Some of them didn't come back. It's just a small, like, you know, I don't know what, what, what the, percent, the percentage of the army, the Meccan army, was able to regroup when, when they saw that Khalid bin Walid attacked from behind. So, so Abu Sufyan said, no. We, we, got, we got our revenge. Let's go. Let's call it a day and go. And they, against the, the opinion of Khalid bin Walid. So Khalid bin Walid claimed this victory. He claimed this as a victory. And they left. 
on their way to Mecca, some way or halfway, they're like, you know, that was not, that was very dumb. Why don't we just go back and finish them, go to Medina? When the Prophet ﷺ heard that, the Prophet ﷺ said, let's go after them. We're not going to wait for them to come to us. We're going to... So when the Meccans heard that the Prophet ﷺ came after them, they thought, okay, he got reinforcement. They're very upset. They're very angry. They lost 70 people. They're coming at, you know, charging at us. We may end up, you know, ruining this victory for ourselves. So let's just continue our, our journey back to Mecca, and they ran away. So that's how it ended. But they said that this battle, right, uh, was, was, was claimed as a, as a victory for Khalid bin Walid and he never lost a battle. Now he may not have won all the battles because he participated in the following major battle against the Muslims which was Al-Khandaq or the, the, the battle of the trench. But he never lost a battle in Jahiliya. And, and, uh, and the trench was the last battle that he, he was part of. Uh, the, la the last actual you know, battle where there was, where, where there was a, a clash. So Khalid ibn Walid remained to be active with, with his tr tribe. He was part of the, of the, uh, the trench, the, the, the campaign of the trench where the, you know, the Meccans you know, amassed a large army joined by some major tribes in, in the Arabian Peninsula, at 10,000, and their goal was not just to avenge themselves from what happened in, in Badr, or, or finish the, it was actually to finish the Muslims off completely. But then when they went, they found that the Muslims have, have you know, built this, this uh, dug this, this trench and they couldn't get through to them. And it was very frustrating. So they besieged, you know, you know they, were, they were surrounding them. They waited for a long time. One of the people that grew very frustrated was Khajim Walid. It's like, how long are we going to wait for this? They keep shooting us with arrows. So Khajim Walid made an attempt to actually uh, with some few horsemen to jump over the trench. So he was one of the people that, that, that made that attempt and the Sahaba were able to stop them. You know, Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, other companions went and, and stood uh, firm, stood their ground and they, they, they pushed back. So uh, all they had to do just, you know, shoot arrows at them so they couldn't get close. Um, so, so eventually Khalid got frustrated and he left the battlefield. This is before the Meccans completely, the winds came and, and destroyed everything. Uh, sorry, he didn't leave. He actually stayed. And wh while everyone was, li was leaving, Khalid bin Walid and Amr bin As were the last uh, individuals or the last part of the army to leave because they were basically, they were afraid that the Muslims may, may follow them, right? So they basically stood. So that, that tells you that Khalid was what? He was looking for trouble. He was looking for a real fight. Just tells you something about his, his, uh, his personality and how decisive he was and how, how committed he was for what he thought was, was, was the right cause. When they saw this, Khalid bin Walid started questioning his own beliefs. Wait a minute. You can't, you know, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his message just keeps getting stronger and stronger. There was one last final stand that Khalid made against Islam and that was the end of it for him and a new a new part of his life started. It was when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the seventh year of the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet decided, and again there are differences of, of opinions amongst historians. Did Khalid bin Walid accept Islam before this or after that? Wallahu Ta'ala A'lam, the correct opinion is that he actually accepted Islam after the, the seventh year, most likely in the eighth year of the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet and his companions, the Prophet had a dream he saw in his dream that they are going to make Umrah, they're going to make Tawaf, and they will be wearing Ihram. And uh, so he made the intention to make Umrah, uh, following the tradition of the Arabian tribes back then, back in the days. So the Prophet ﷺ went there and he, he had, he had um, you know, they say something between one to 2,000 people with him. So that's a large number of people in those days. And they were all Muslims, right? So they're going to Mecca, and Khalid bin Walid and the Meccans, the Meccans, by the way, were exhausted by then. The failure of the Battle of the Trench, you know, kind of lingered. You know, they ran out of funds. They were, doing, they were miserable, right? But when they learned that the Prophet, that Muhammad, the Muslims are coming, they're like, no, this is not happening. So Khalid bin Walid took, took his, his, uh, his soldiers with him, and he said, I'm going to stop them. I don't want to say single-handedly, but he had... So he said, 
I'm not going to wait for the Meccans to, he was the most, I'm, I'm stopping them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam either received a revelation from Allah or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received some, some intelligence that Khalid bin Walid is waiting to ambush them. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told his companions to make a maneuver, to change their route. Last minute. And while Khalid was waiting, next thing he knows, Khalid, the, the Muslims have already bypassed him and they're about to descend into the valley of Mecca. Right? And of course it was too late. That's what are you going to do? Yeah. So when all of a sudden the, the, the she camel of the Prophet wasallam stopped and kneeled. And the Sahaba said, because the, the, the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard that the Meccans would not allow him to come in, he was going. He's like, if they try to stop us, we're fighting. We have the right, like every other tribe. We're not here to fight, we're here to make tawaf, and we're here to show reverence to the, to the, holy, to the sacred place. If they, if they deprive us from this right, then we're going to do it forcefully. We're going to, to force our way in. Right? And they had the number, and they, then they were ready for that. But subhanAllah, the, the, the she camel stops. So the Sahaba said, get up, get up. Like they were, like, you know. Yeah. So the Prophet said, leave, her, leave, leave it, leave it alone. So they said, khala'at al-qaswa, you know, qaswa is misbehaving. They said, ma khala'at, wa ma thalika laha bi khulq. He said, that's not from her character. The Prophet said, bal habasaha habis al-feel. The one who prevented the elephant from entering Mecca prevented her. Meaning who? Allah. And he knew that this is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah revealed to him later that if the Meccans ask for, for a truce, right, they come up with a proposal, you know, accept it. So Khalid bin Walid, now his role pretty much came obsolete. Khalid is just watching this whole thing unfold in front of him. There's nothing he can do. The negotiations started. The negotiations eventually led to the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah. Because the, where the camel stopped was next to Al Hudaybiyah. So the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah took place without going into the details of Al Hudaybiyah. And the Muslims decided, you know, were told to go back, right? And come back the following year and perform Umrah al Qadha. And uh, of course, it was, it was not something very pleasing to many of them. Of them. They were very frustrated. They, they, so they saw, like, can you imagine? They actually, they were able to see the, 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 the Mecca. Mecca was right there. That's the closest they got to Mecca. But they were not allowed to come near, near the Kaaba. So eventually, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions retreated to Medina. <coughs> During this time, there was, there was a, a treaty, right? There was peace, there was truce. And Khalid finally had a chance now not to think as a warrior who's trying to defend his, his, but as an individual who was very intelligent and very smart. And they said that the Prophet ﷺ used to say, during that time his brother accepted Islam, Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid. So Al-Walid ibn Al-Walid accepted Islam when he went to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet said to Al-Walid, you know, I think Khalid, I, I know that Khalid, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said to Al-Walid, ما مثل خالد يجهل الإسلام. Now someone like someone like Khalid should not should, by now should realize that Islam is should understand and realize what Islam is. He's a very intelligent, very wise man. He wasn't just like he wasn't only muscles. Khalid was a was a brilliant, uh, you know, brilliant person, and you know, and I don't think we're gonna have time to go into the 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 how how brilliant this man was. So um, so he said. The Prophet ﷺ sent Al-Walid with a message to Khalid. He said, go talk to him. Tell him. Tell him we can, Muslims can, can use his, his uh, talents and his strength. You know. Tell him to be on the side of the, of the truth instead of joining uh, or protecting uh, batil falsehood. He said, and if he joins us, you know, he will, لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ وَلَقَدَّمْنَاهُ عَلَىٰ غَيْرِهِ he will have greater status in his city. So Al-Walid and Khalid at that point was خلاص, done. You know, on his own, he said, you know, this is the truth. I mean, look at this. The more we fight them, the stronger they get. So Khalid came to that conclusion. Yes, it means that my dad was wrong. My brother Al-Walid already figured that out and he committed. You know, my brother, you know, Hisham also, same thing. So what am I waiting for? 
Oh, sorry, Hisham accepted Islam later. Uh, he said, what am I waiting for? So he was done. While he was contemplating how he's going to go and, and approach the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Walid came and they had this conversation and he told him, listen, um, I'm, I'm accepting Islam, so I'm going to come. So Khalid basically was, got ready. On his way, Khalid felt, um, uh, Khalid felt very, uh, very awkward going alone. And he was hoping, he said, he said, I said to myself, I wish I can, I can have someone to, uh, to join me. Okay, I wish I can. So he ran into Uthman ibn Talha from Bani Abd dar He said, where are you going? He said, I'm go he said Muhammad, is, this is haq. I'm going to go and submit and accept Islam. He said, I am, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. So they, they followed each other. Almost two-thirds of, of the path, Amr ibn al-As had gone to Abyssinia, tried to make a deal with, with the emperor there, Najashi. Uh, and then the Najashi there told him, Amr, you're a smart person. Don't you realize? And Najashi uh, had accepted Islam. It's like, don't you realize that he is indeed a prophet? He is indeed a prophet. The, the angel that comes to Moses comes to him. The, the angel that came to Moses comes to him. Listen to me, Amr, and accept, you know, embrace him. So Amr said, give me, give me, he actually shook hands with the Najashi and said, I pledge that I will accept, accept the Prophet Sallallahu and accept Islam. And he left Abyssinia and on his way, subhanAllah, look, this is, this is the, uh, يعني, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. On his way to Medina, he runs into Uthman ibn Talha and Khalid ibn Walid. And he's like, hey, friends, old friends, they were very close. Like, where are you going? They're like, and they told him that we are going to Medina to, uh, to embrace Islam. He said, I am here for the same reason. So the three of them went. Amr ibn As you know, relates this story. Khadim ibn Walid also relates this story, each one from his, his perspective. Khadim ibn Walid was the first one that the Prophet sallam, well, you know, the, the first one to declare it. Amr was the last of the three. Uh, they shook hands with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Khalid Walid actually they said when he walked in, he, he already, yani when he walked in, he said, Assalamu Alaikum Ya Rasulullah or Ya Nabi Allah. He greeted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Nubuwa, which was a clear indication that, that and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the, the companions say that was, one, that was one of the most joyous days in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. When Khalid, uh, Uthman ibn Talha and Amr ibn al-As accepted Islam. This was, يعني, this you know, called for a separate, separate, you know, celeb celebration. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khalid ibn Walid, they say, told Abu Bakr when he was in Medina, he told Abu Bakr that I had a dream. And dreams are from who? From Allah. Just to see that guidance is all ultimately from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, I had a dream that I left a, a barren land that was struck by drought and I found myself traveling and entering a green flush, you know, a, a green beautiful piece of land. So, uh, so and, and Abu Bakr was one of the people known to interpret dreams. So Abu Bakr told him that that is your guidance, that's your journey from, 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 uh, from kufr, from a state of disbelief to, to Islam, and hopefully that land is Medina, inshallah. So, uh, um, so he joined the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's uh, campaign. Uh, so he joined the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had just missed Khaybar, which was a, a decisive great victory for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during that, the eighth year, he learned that the king or the emperor of the uh, Ghassanid um, uh, empire or kingdom to the north, these were Arab tribes originally from Yemen, resided in, in what we call modern day Sham region, the northern part of Arabia, right? The northern part of Arabia and the Sham region. Right, was all under their control. They were, uh, they were, they had an alliance with the uh, the Romans and the the Byzantines. So they had they, they had a strong alliance, and they had prepared. The Prophet you know, 
the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had uh, already uh, attempted to to uh, to fight them but there was no fight tabuk the year before so when they and and so when the prophet came to them they they you know they stopped their campaign but then they 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 started regrouping and preparing themselves to invade medina so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent to them an army the, led by zayd ibn haritha right who was who used to be his adopted son uh, and Ja'far and if something happens to Zayd then Ja'far ibn Abi Talib takes command of the army and if something the Prophet sallallahu said if something happens to Ja'far because remember during these days the commander of the army did not stay in a like well protected um, you know room right situation room and, and you know no no they were in the forefront they were in, they were they were leading the army right so, so he said, if, if something happens to Zayd, then Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, his cousin, anhu, who had just come the year before from where? From Abyssinia. And, and if something happens to Ja'far, then Abdullah ibn Rawaha, anhu. and if something happens to Ja'far, uh, to Abdullah, then the Muslims should nominate someone. So, of course, uh, uh, that was the battle of Mu'ta. Uh, and they engaged, they, you know, they, it, was, it, was a, it was a massive, uh, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a large army of, for, for the Muslims relative, you know, compared to that time. But it was a, they were facing the largest army ever. Up to this point, they have never seen an army greater and bigger than that. And I don't want to go into the numbers because there's a lot of differences of opinions. But it seems to have been, the ratio was somewhere from 1 to 7 to 1 to 10. Or one to twelve, in some way. So it, you know, most likely it was one to five, one to seven. That's that's the. And indeed, Zayd ibn Haritha was killed. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib al-Tayyar radiyallahu anhu arda was killed, and then eventually Abdullah ibn Rawaha was killed. And it was chaos. Khalid ibn Walid took charge of that army. The Muslims said to Khalid, Khalid, come do something. You were there, and it was his first major battle. That, that he, he joined, and Khalid bin Walid turned what could have been a very, um, you know, uh, very devastating defeat into victory. And he was able to, uh, to withdraw the army with the least amount, and they were able to inflict serious damage on the, on, the, on the other side, so much so that the other side completely said, okay, you know, we can't find these people. These people are ready to defend themselves, you know. Remember, the Muslims went all the way to their territory <coughs> to stop them in their, in their tracks. So Khalid bin Walid came back, and again, he, this is another battle that, that was a loss. And the Prophet wasallam said, some people say it was before that, some people say it's, it's during the battle, the Prophet wasallam informed the Sahaba, because Wahi came to him, as to what happened. The Muslims started to mourn some of the dead when the Prophet wasallam reported to them what happened. He said, Zayd was killed, his own adopted son. Ja'far was killed. Abdullah bin Rawaha was killed. And then, and then a sword of the swords of Allah. One of the swords of Allah took charge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him victory. Right? And that, was, that, one, that man was known, uh, was later, they realized that it was Khadim al-Walid. Khadim al-Walid, after that, Khalid bin Walid, radiallahu anhu, arda, the Prophet وسلم, sent him in some, uh, you know, to, to fight some small battles here and there, trying to, uh, you know, control. You know, it was always a very fluid situation. Remember, things were not always stable. You, you always had to, to you, have, you had scrimmages here and there. You had, you had some small tribes trying to attack the t territory of the Muslim community, f you know, from all kinds of, uh, from, you know, different places. Then Khalid bin Walid, uh, you know, made some, 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 you know, mistakes with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, there was, there was a battle where Khadim Walid did something the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't order him to do. So remember, Khad was very committed, you know, so he overdid it. Uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Abra'u ilayka mimma sana'a Khalid. Right? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
paid for the casualties that were that were that fell during this this incident. Um, and in spite of this mistake, the Prophet Sallallahu still continued to use Khalid in these major um, battles. Uh, wait, what did I did I say? Tabuk? Tabuk hasn't take, taken place. Tabuk was after Mu'tah. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. I take that back. I was, I was, no. Tabuk was a after Mu'tah because Khalid radiallahu anhu did participate in Tabuk as well where there was no battle, there was no fight. Yeah, I take that back. And then uh, I'm just trying to get quickly to, uh, to, to the, the, the main, the greatest of all, which is Fath Makkah, the opening of Makkah, which happened two years after that, right? In the ninth year, right? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes to take Makkah and the Prophet Sallallahu divided his army into, it was a massive army, 10,000 you know, soldier, warriors. The Prophet Sallallahu divided the army and Khalid bin Walid was, was in charge again of a, of, a, of a division. That was the only division that actually fought into its way to Mecca. Every, all the other ones just entered Mecca with no, with no fight. Khalid bin Walid was confronted with a group from the Meccans under the leadership of none other than his own cousin. Ikrima, Nabi Jal. And this is a strange, it's just, it's, there are some family dynamics involved in this. So, so anyways, they, they took Mecca, the, uh, Khalid Walid was part of that battle as well. And he, in every battle Khalid Walid joined, right, he either won or he didn't lose. Now, so now everyone is saying Khalid Walid, Khalid Walid is like, cannot be defeated, right. So, and then the Prophet Sallallahu passed away. And as soon as the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, there was many tribes in Arabia apostatized. The only territory that remained under Islam was Mecca, Medina, Taif. That's it. And then small pockets here and there, but almost 90% of the Arabian Peninsula left Islam. Or some of them decided not to pay zakah. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu made his decision to fight them. And some of the Sahaba said, you know, you know, we can't fight everyone. He's like, I will fight them one after another. And Khalid bin Walid played a major role in these, uh, in these uh, battles. And the greatest of all uh, of these battles was Al-Yamama, which was actually led by him, right? Banu Hanifa, 40,000 um, fighters with Musaylama, the liar, who, by the way, Musaylama claimed to be a prophet while the Prophet was still alive. The Prophet ﷺ had intended to, to uh, and by the way, very interesting thing uh, a lot of people don't know about Musaylam is that the Prophet ﷺ was told about him. And the Prophet ﷺ had a dream. And in his dream, he said, I saw that I had, I had two gold, golden um, uh, bracelets. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't like that. And he said, I was bothered by them, so I blew on them and they flew away. They, they, I got rid of them. So he said, and I interpreted that to be two false prophets that will claim to be prophets and they will have major following, but they will be defeated eventually. And one of them was Musaylama, and the other one was Sujah, the, you know. Um, so so Khalid bin Walid, you know, took part of these, of these uh, of multiple battles leading to the, to the, you know, most, you know, most remembered of all of them, which was the Battle of Al-Yamama, where Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu arda, you know, led an army of, you know, he had many companions with him, and they fought, um, you know, for, for a long time, radiallahu anhu, for days. Eventually, um, that, you know, the Banu Hanifa lost the battle, Musaylama was killed, and again, Khalid also claimed that, that victory. Um, and after he finished, for, you know, that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu sent him to, to Iraq. Go follow Muthanna, join him, take charge of the army, and start. So Khalid went to Iraq, you know, you know, conquered, you know, won almost won every battle, every single battle, right? And there were some famous incidents in Iraq. We can't, we won't be able to uh, to stop, you know. Um, Anyone knows what was the most, well, okay, never mind. But then there was something very interesting that happened. While he was in Iraq, there were armies uh, in the northern part in the, in the Sham region, right? 
And they were particularly, they, they were, I mean, to be precise, there were four armies there, led by different people. Uh, Abu Ubaidah, Shurahir ibn Hasana, you know, Amr ibn As. So, uh, and Akhu uh, Muawiyah, man. Yeah, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan. Right? These, these four armies. Abu Bakr sent a message to Abu Ubaidah. And these four armies were fighting, they were doing well, but then at some point, they couldn't, they couldn't advance anymore. And the Romans gathered a massive army to fight them. So Abu Bakr sent a message to these four armies to join forces in one place, fight, fight as one front, right? And try to delay engaging the, the, the enemies until Khalid arrives. But Khalid is all the way in Iraq. And, and a battle can, 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 can ignite any, any moment. Right? So what are we going to do? Khalid, when he received the message, leave Al-Muthanna in charge of, of the battles in, in Iraq, and you move to, to get to Yarmouk as soon as possible. They said Khalid traveled from Iraq to Yarmouk. It, it was a, a record-breaking amount of time. Non-stop, you know, around the clock, they traveled, and he reached them in five days. Right? Just in time before the Battle of Al-Yarmouk started and Khalid became the general or the, 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 basically the commander of all the, the armies, all four divisions, in, including you know, those whom he had with him. And Khalid took charge and they fought and they fought and they fought for days and it was a fierce battle, many casualties. Khalid ibn Walid himself you know, was, was engaged all the way they said Khalid had broke uh, in some, some narrations. How many swords? They say six in some narrations. They say nine swords. And, he, you know, and by the way, don't, you know, every time Khalid is getting injured, right? he had all kinds of wounds. Right? But you know, he fought عنه, until they won the battle. Right? Um, and maybe in the future there, there should be lectures just about some of these battles and the tactics that they use. Uh, Battle of the Irmuk was, was, was just something else, you know. It was, uh, um, during that, during the battle, Abu Bakr passed away. And Umar radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa. The first decision Umar made, the very first decision, was to demote Khalid. And he sent a message. And Khalid was who? His own? Yeah, and he almost like, a, like an uncle to him. You know, like they were the same age, yani very close. But uh, Umar sends a message to Abu Ubaidah that you're in charge. And by the way, Umar had great reverence and respect for Abu Ubaidah. Right? Umar used to say, if Abu Ubaidah, when, when Umar, before his death, Umar used to say, if Abu Ubaidah was alive, he would have been, I would have put him in charge to be the Khalifa after me. Ya Allah, anhum ajma'in. So Umar sent a message to Abu Ubaidah that you're in charge now take charge and, you know, tell Khalid he's no longer the commander. Abu Ubaidah, he's now in charge, right? But he didn't announce that. So he let Khalid finish the, the battle after they won the battle because if, had he made that, that, you know, that announcement, that would have affected the morale of the army. After the end of the battle, while they were ce celebrating the victory, Abu Ubaidah informed them, read the, 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 the message, that, um, the letter Umar sent, and Khalid submitted to that and accepted it. And radiallahu anhu wa and he became almost an advisor, right? And he joined the battles, all the battles, all the way till they, you know, uh, all the way to Damascus and all of that. And they, they seized Hims. Uh, at the age of 50, Khalid Murid radiallahu anhu uh, contracted, uh, you, know, um, you know, some people say it was uh, a plague. It was a plague. Uh, he fell ill, radiallahu anhu, he was sick. Uh, for a few days, and then um, he, radiallahu anhu, died. You know what what is known as natural death uh, from this from this disease. And in his on his deathbed, they said he said, "Here I am. Right? I have. There isn't any part of my body except that it has a wound. Right? It has a scar from uh, from an arrow, from from a blow of a, of, of a sword." But here I am today, dying on my bed, like anyone else. Like, he actually said, like, like a camel, like an old cam camel, right? 
فلا نامت أعين الجبناء. You know, you can't translate this. How do you translate this? So he said, let, let not the eyes of, of cowards enjoy any sleep. In other words, he's saying that coward people are, make no sense. They're like, they're, you know, it's, you can't, here I am, Khalid Walid basically was charging. Khalid Walid, he was a high risk, <laughs> you know, uh, individual. Yeah, and he, I can't imagine what, what the life insurance of someone Khalid Walid, what the premium of that would have been <laughs> like. Because he was always, for Khal, he was, he was a high target, right? He was like the most valuable, you know, sought after a target by his enemies, right? Yet, Khalid Walid drank poison in, in Persia, and his, he survived that. Khalid Walid fought all kinds of battles. There was a conspiracy actually to assassinate him in Persia. He survived that, radiallahu anhu wa right? And he was always there in the forefront fighting, right? Sought death, but death, you know, evaded or avoided Khalid, right? Because it was the qadr of Allah that he will die on his deathbed. Radiallahu anhu he was, he, was, he died and he was uh, buried in, in the city of Homs. Uh, and they say that his grave is still known until this day. Uh, of course, during the revolution, there was, it, was, it was destroyed. Uh, but I, I saw some, I tried to verify this. I saw that they rebuilt uh, the mosque. I don't know. Anyways, so his, uh, his, uh, his grave is known in, in the city of Hums, radiallahu anhu wa Again, as I said, he died at the age of 50. So 50, that means he died the year 642, right? Because he, yeah, he was born 592, so he died 600. 642 of the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during the, uh, the, the era of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu wa aradah.